friends. So we, I posted one uh, lecture on the creeds last week. I'm probably going to go ahead and, and repost it in this section, just so if you missed it, you can get a get a look at it. Now this is sort of like a part two to that lecture, and it also addresses something that I, th I if I remember right, was a uh, forum post by I think Elizabeth was jumping in at some point on somebody's forum post last week and was talking uh, a little bit of it, it was it was about um, um, we don't as Protestants for those of us who are Protestants we don't necessarily go to the tradition um, to know what we believe and by traditions we talk about maybe the creeds instead we go to the Bible right um, you may have heard uh, what um, Ad Fontes that's uh, the Protestant Reformation um, and really the, the Renaissance uh, call to, to, to the text, ad fontes, to the fountain, the, the, the source, uh, to get to the sources. And so for Christians, the sources are, are the scriptures. And this was to avoid, say, um, what had been maybe the tradition, which was reflecting just on what the tradition, what theologians had said. Instead, let's find out what the scriptures say. Well, this isn't actually uh, something new. This is something that um, has been a part of Christian history since the very beginning. In fact, the first people who said ad fontes, or back to the source, to the text, let's look at the Bible, were uh, heretics, <laughs> if you can believe it or not. Um, the Gnostics, the Gnostics in the second century were the first um, people in or around the church to say, oh no, we need to go back to the Bible. And what the Gnostics would do is they would they would look at the Bible and they would say, well, it says this, 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 and this, and if you combine that with this philosophy, then maybe it looks like such and such or whatever. And what the Gnostics would come up with is, is a system that looks totally nothing like uh, what Orthodox Christianity um, preached in the churches. In fact, Irenaeus says, uh, he's, Irenaeus writes um, Adversus Heresies. Uh, it's like a four, four or five book four or five volume ref refutation of the major Gnostic groups, um, the, what, the Valentinians and the Ophites, I think. Um, and a lot of what irony is, he like debates these little tiny points and it gets a little bit um, uh, difficult times and a little bit boring, a little bit obscure, weird. But he has these parts where he talks about um, just how we read scripture, how we interpret scripture. And he, and he talks about the regula fide or the rule of faith. Um, he'll also talk about um, the rule of truth, regula veritas. Uh, and what Irenaeus is saying is he's saying, look, the real question is not whether or not you're going to the scriptures. We're all going to be doing that. The real question is who's reading the scriptures right? Whose interpretation is correct? Now, as Protestants, we come from a long tradition of saying, well, we let the scriptures interpret themselves, right? Uh, I think I want to say John Calvin and Martin Luther both have um, sections where they talk about letting the different parts of Scripture interpret the other parts. And it's almost as if the Bible is a self-interpreting book, uh, that the Bible has a clear, consistent um, message, and that we just need to generate that from exegesis. I want to push back a little bit on that. I want to suggest that that's maybe not the case, uh, that in fact... Um, well, I think in a lot of ways, Jehovah's Witnesses um, make some possibly legitimate exegetical moves. But I also want to say that the Jehovah's Witnesses are wrong about uh, the nature and identity of Jesus. Uh, I want to say the same thing about Mormons. I think the Mormons have some places where, I, from a purely exegetical perspective, I'm not sure that we can just exclude everything that the Mormons say. Likewise, when Irenaeus was writing, um, a lot of times the, the, the Gnostics by the by the the standards of interpretation of the day we're coming up with pretty reasonable readings of texts not everything they said was insane so the the, the difficulty was you know how how do how do we know that we're interpreting rightly how do we know that we're reading correctly how do we know we're getting the right message from the scriptures and the way Irenaeus uh, talked about it he said imagine you have a mosaic right a mosaic you know a little um, a bunch of uh, little pieces of color, right? And you can organize them in a certain way. He says, well, the Gnostics, they take um, this mosaic uh, from the scriptures and they put all the little pieces of the scriptures together. And when they're done, you look at it and you have a picture of a dog, right? 
And Irenaeus says, no, 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 no. The scriptures do not give us the picture of a dog. No, the scriptures give us a picture of a king. And what you have to do is you have to know how to take the different parts of scripture and put them together in the right way so that when you step back, you see in scripture a picture of Christ the king and not uh, this, this bizarre mutt Christ that the Gnostics come up with. Well, how do you do that? How do you make sure that your interpretation comes up with the king and not the dog? To that, for that, uh, Irenaeus says, we read by the rule of truth. We read by the rule of faith. And the rule of faith is, and I don't want to totally codify it here uh, because I don't think it can be codified, but it's, it's basically a story throughout scripture that there is a creator God who interacts in a number of different ways with the world, who, who covenants with the people Israel, who rescues them time and again, who puts up with their sin, who, who forgets it, who punishes them when they need to be punished. Uh, but, but this God who has this vision, this total, this vision of total salvation, of total worship of himself, who then is revealed, disclosed to us as being Father, Son, and Spirit, uh, who gives himself in the Son to the world. This Son uh, takes on uh, himself at the cross all of the world's um, wrongdoing, uh, is executed, uh, is raised the third day, who then gives his Spirit to the church. That basic story is something like the rule of truth. That's the rule of faith. No matter what you do exegetically with scripture, as long as you come up with something that is consistent with that story, what you're doing is reading by the rule of faith. You're in danger when you start coming up, when you start doing exegesis and whatnot, and you come up with something that does not agree with that. So, for example, in uh, contemporary theology, uh, the oneness Pentecostals are kind of a sort of like an edgy type of, of group. Are they Christians? Are they not? The problem is, is that they have interpretations of the scriptures that deny Trinitarianism. And you'll get the same thing with Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. At the, at the end of the day, you're going to have a real hard time with any of those groups agreeing that God is both one and three that the three persons of the Trinity are distinct and yet are part of the same single unified eternal will of one God. You're going to have a hard time recogn recognizing that the God of the Old Testament is in fact the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is completely in keeping with that God's character. Only by accepting from the outset this basic story of who God is are you able to fit the, the pieces of Scripture together in the right spot. You're not going to put an Isianic oracle um, over and above something else unless, it's, unless it belongs there in that basic story. Now, um, if you read Irenaeus, you can see that time and time again when he goes against the Gnostics, he, he's basically saying, yeah, you, the Bible says that, sure, but you're putting it out of order. You're not putting it in the right spot. You're just taking this out of, and it's not even always context, although sometimes context as well. Uh, sometimes the, the, the Gnostics have great contextual exegesis. The problem is, is that they're giving too much um, credit to one thing at the expense of another. So, um, long story short, um, you know, the Bible alone, is it enough? Well, I, I, I think I would answer that question by saying I'm, I'm an evangelical Protestant. I preach the word uh, Sunday to Sunday. But I, I also want to say that I'm not naive. I know that in order for the Bible to mean something, someone has to read it. There isn't a Bible. If there's no one reading texts, texts don't have any meaning. They're just, they're no different than, than wood or, or stones. Uh, they're just there. So I understand that in order for the Bible to mean something, I, have, I or somebody else has to be reading it, has to be engaging with it. Um, and so I trust the rule of truth to guide me as I do that in conjunction with a close, deep reading of texts using good, solid exegetical methods. At the end of the day, I can trust that my exegesis hasn't gone completely off the rails when I step back and I think about what I've done with Scripture and I realize that it's still in keeping with that basic story, the story that the narrative that the church has, and Irenaeus says this, this is what the church preaches always and everywhere. As long as I'm still in keeping with that, 
then I can have some freedom and not worry too much about whether or not um, I'm, you know, got, got every single darn thing right. Because I know that on the broad strokes, I'm still in keeping with the tradition. I'm still orthodox from the perspective of the Trinitarian Church. What does that have to do with the creeds? Well, uh, the short answer is, you know, this last mi micro lecture, I suggested that the creeds orient us. Uh, they give us a truthful understanding of what the world's like. And if we have that truthful understanding of the world, a Trinitarian world, a g creator God who sends his son and his spirit kind of world, if that's the kind of world we see when we interact with things, well, then when we read scripture, we're going to be finding that story. We're going to be reading that story and not some other one. So the creeds, uh, the classical ecumenical creeds at least, are, are ways that shape our thinking so that we read better in scripture. And if you're a part of a tradition that has maybe that confesses something like uh, what the Westminster uh, Catechism, I think the Westminster Catechism, yeah, uh, a reformed um, doctrine, doctrinal statement. If you assent to that and you see the world that way, then you're going to be better at reading scripture in a reformed kind of way. Your, your, your imagination is going to be shaped that way so that when you read certain things in scripture, things, words like justification and righteousness, you're going to read them in a certain kind of way that is in keeping with your tradition. Uh, so rather than just a list of beliefs that we either assent or dissent from, the creeds are an orienting apparatus that ensure that we are in keeping with the, uh, the grand Christian vision. And so the ecumenical creeds are important because they're the kinds of creeds that are truly ecumenical, whether you're Roman Catholic, Greek Orthodox, Reformed, Lutheran, Methodist, uh, Baptist, Evangelical, non denom Pentecostal, Charismatic, whatever you are, you can, along with all the rest of the Christians in history, assent, yes, this is what the world's basically like. And that's, um, that's kind of the yeah, rule of truth. That was long. <laughs>